All right, so we're using the WebEx platform for our presentation today and on the screen you should see our housekeeping slide um, with the available controls for you. So today we'll be using the chat to ask any questions. Um, and also, if you would like to be unmuted or you need to be unmuted, also let us know in the chat um, if you would like to ask questions or if we need further details on any questions. Um, and if you have, if you need any further information or need technical assistance, you can follow. There's a link down here. It says check out this guide. I know we don't have the link, but um, we can drop that in the chat so you can check out the guide if you need any further assistance with the WebEx. Thank you very much, Tessa. I appreciate you uh, introducing this topic for us today. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rob Dietrich, and I am the uh, section chief for digital teaching and learning uh, and the home base manager. And we're very glad to have you here today to talk about the graduate data verification and how that uh, this is actually done in conjunction with accountability services. And uh, Curtis Sonneman is here as well. Uh, as we go through this presentation to make sure that the GDV is very important and we're going to discuss how it works in PowerSchool. We're going to discuss what it is. We're going to discuss the types of graduates. We're going to discuss what you need to do in order to get a student to show on the GDV, how the data flows from PowerSchool to accountability, and the data corrections request process, and then making data corrections in PowerSchool. If you do have any questions, please put them in the chat. We will be monitoring that. Uh, and we will do our best to answer your questions as what we have commonly done. If we cannot answer your question or we are unsure of an answer, we will record that. And we have been putting out FAQs about a week or two after the webinars to make sure that we answer the questions that we receive. Curtis, is there anything you would like to say? I, I hate to give you out. Is there anything you'd like to say at this moment? No, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate the collaboration between PowerSchool and accountability services to uh, have conversations around the GDV and it, its implications for uh, things uh, for collecting graduates and things like the cohort graduation rate. Um, thank you, Curtis. I think one of the things too I do want to point out is I imagine as anyone on this call who is familiar with this from the accountability side or maybe the academic side or the student information side, uh, we will do our best to answer questions. However, I don't know we can answer every individual scenario question that comes up today. This is very much meant to give you an overview to make sure that everyone understands how this process works. If you do have questions that get into the weeds of this report, we will be happy to discuss that with you, but we will probably reach out to you on an individual basis because that way we can really discuss the issue you're having. If there are students who are not appearing on the report as you run this report, or if you wanna discuss things that you've had happen in the past. Okay, let's, let's get to it. What is GDB? GDV stands for the graduate graduation data verification. This report displays each student who has graduated, not necessarily the cohort. There is a difference between the cohort and what this report does. This is for each student who has graduated in the current school year between July 16th of the current year and July 15th of the next year. So this report does not follow the typical window of June, uh, July 1 to June 30. This one bleeds into the next year just a little bit. Uh, I do want to point out a very important note as you work with this report. Essentially, if a student is not listed on this report, DPI will have no record that that student was ever a graduate. If there's one thing I can tell you and you get out of this report, there are a couple of times I'm gonna say that, but one of the key items for this presentation is a student must be on this list if DPI is gonna have any record of that student being an official graduate. There are three types of graduates. There's an early graduate. These are students who graduate after the first day of school and before the last day of school. There is a regular graduate. This is a student who finishes the school year and graduates on the last day of school 
or before July 15th. And then there is a summer graduate. They are students who usually finish after July 15th, but before the first day of school the next year, and they must have in their stored grade in PowerSchool, they must have passed a summer school LOCS course in stored grades under the How Taken field. This is also another key item. A student should not be entered as a graduate unless they have met all state and local graduation requirements. Certain fields need to be updated on the North Carolina Information Academic screen in order for the student to display properly. Again, I just wanna point out that no student should be entered into this process through PowerSchool and in turn into accountability until they have met all state and local graduation requirements. The North Carolina information academic screen is where the information that populates the GDV comes from a majority of them. The grade nine entry date. This is the year the student first entered ninth grade, and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the ninth grade entry date uh, in the next couple of slides. I, and you will hear this more than once in this presentation. If a student is a repeater, you will use the very first year, not any repeated year. So if you have a student who entered ninth grade this year, their date would have been July 1, 2020. And in the event that they do not make it to 10th grade this year, you do not adjust that ninth grade entry date because they are returning to ninth grade. It is their initial ninth grade entry date. The bound for field is another mandatory field for this report. That says what the student is going to do after high school. There are several choices there. Uh, the one you see here is a private senior institution, which is one of the choices. There are two dates involved on this screen, the diploma granted date and the diploma issued date. Each one serves a purpose for this report. The diploma, and uh, to be perfectly honest with folks out there, I have run this report for a long time. I knew that both report, both of those dates were necessary. I wasn't sure how each one functioned until I was uh, researching for this presentation. So I'm glad to be able to give that to you. The date the student met for diploma granted date, it is the date the student met all graduation requirements. And this date populates the reports. The diploma issue date, which could be the same as the diploma granted date, this determines in which collection they appear. So the granted date is there again, the requirements, the issue date determines what collection they appear in. So essentially telling the report what type of graduate they are, are they an early graduate or regular graduate or a summer graduate? And then the diploma type is the type of diploma that the student receives. A majority of students in the state of North Carolina receive a FRC diploma. However, there are certain uh, small cases where a student might receive a certificate, and that is where you would determine that in that diploma type field. Are there any questions so far, Tessa or John? Does not appear. Okay, thank you. Oh, wait, ninth, sorry. We do have yep. one question. Sure. Um, when do graduates populate in the C? Rod, oh, CGR audit. When should that, I expect to see mid year graduates in the CGR audit? That is a great question. I would like to answer that question when we get to talking about that. We will answer that question later in this presentation. And that's the only question we have so far. Thank you. Thank you. On the North Carolina information academic screen, again, I uh, refer to, we will speak a little bit more about the ninth grade entry date. The ninth grade entry date is an extremely important field in power school. The ninth grade entry date, this is the first time the student comes to your school uh, and enters ninth grade for the first time ever. And I gave a couple of examples down below. If a student comes to your school in 10th grade from out of state 
in July of 21, the ninth grade entry date must be reviewed on the student's transcript to identify the first year. Just because they're a 10th grader does not necessarily mean the previous year was the ninth grade entry date. It could be that they were a repeater and it was two years ago or maybe more. Again, and if a student repeats ninth grade for the second time, the ninth grade entry date is based on the first time entry in ninth grade from the previous year. I do have a note here, which we will see again on the next slide. Once accountability services captures the ninth grade entry date, it can only be changed through a data correction. This is also a key as we work through this process. One of the reasons why I am so glad that accountability services and the home base team are doing this together is because the GDV and the cohort graduation rate are very much something that um, both sides need to communicate on and really work together to make sure that the information in each report is accurate and correct. Again, the ninth grade entry date, and for you power school coordinators that are here, I have added what field that is. And if you want to pull that or take a look in your search bar, if you do that search, it will list everybody's ninth grade entry date if you're doing a list students or a quick export. The grade nine entry date must be entered as soon as it's determined by the authoritative source upon enrollment. And the reason that I have put that in there as soon as it is determined, there are some times where I had students that entered a school and we were unable to get a transcript for weeks because sometimes the student came from out of country or out of state and it took a little while to get that record. But once you know what that ninth grade entry date is, please put that in based on the authoritative source, usually a transcript, put that grade nine entry date in. Accountability services will collect this date on the first data collection the student is found in grade nine or above for assignment in a graduation cohort. It cannot be changed in accountability data systems without a data correction. And it definitely should not be initially put in right before graduation. One of the things that I like to do when I was out on the field is in between June 1st and June 30, once it was understood who was going to uh, my eighth graders that were gonna become ninth graders, I mass populated that field to make sure that all my eighth graders had the proper ninth grade entry date before they were promoted through EOI. Because I knew if I ran it after EOI, I could alter, I couldn't run it for all ninth graders because there may be um, some repeaters involved. So I always tried to catch those kids before they went to high school to populate that with the accurate date. There are four steps to the GDV process. You are to run the report. You verify the students are correct. You troubleshoot any missing students. And then you approve the report by the submission end date. This report needs to be run frequently and often. Once it is run, it will transfer the data to accountability services overnight. There is usually about a 24 hour delay. Obviously it might be a little bit sooner than that. Uh, it might not be the full 24 hours, but it definitely takes an overnight process. Uh, again, I do wanna reiterate that point. It does not have to be approved for accountability services to get the report. It just has to be run. So please do not approve that report until you are satisfied that that report is accurate and correct in the submission window. But please run that report frequently and run it often. If you have, there were many times we would have, uh, I know after school where students would kind of graduate and we would run that report, populate everything they'd be populated and run it again. And then we would check it the next day to make sure that students populated correctly because we were tracking our graduation rate almost daily. The preliminary report must be approved by the close of business on June 30th. And the final GDV report must be run and approved by each PSU before the submission window ends on July 20th. I do want to mention Real quick on that last one, there's usually been a point of confusion on the final GDV 
let's say that my preliminary GDV is accurate and correct. There's no problems. I didn't graduate any kids through summer school, so my preliminary and the final are exactly the same. The final GDV report still has to be run and approved. So even if there are no changes, you still have to run that report for accountability services to pick up that final run. Curtis, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think that I think that that covers that particular piece. I think the important thing is, is that the report has to be run in order for us to start receiving the data. So to the question about, I think this is a good time to answer that initial question we got, yeah. Rob, about when graduates populate into the cohort graduation rate audit process um, that accountability service team members in the districts see. Uh, that's once those courts begin to run, we see those files are then passed over. You would, you should see students in the in the graduate files that accountability services receives. If that file has not been run, mid year graduates would not populate. Correct. And also, it's usually within the submission window. Sometimes it takes a little bit for the GDV to show up, the preliminary GDV to show up. So obviously, once you put that in. The GDV report is populated on your stating reporting screen. You hit run, it runs. You should see your mid year graduates. Those will then, in the overnight process, flow over into the system uh, into accountability services. I have listed down below all of the information can be found at the following links. We have an early graduate QRD, a summer graduate QRD, and graduating students is actually part of the EOI guide, and it's on page eight. And that is where you can see all the directions that are with this. And I'm sure there's already a question in the chat. Um, we will share this recording and this presentation with you to make sure you have access to these links. And Rob, we do have a question about the grade nine entry date. Sure. Um, if grade nine date of entry is blank and then entered, do you still need a data correction to update the file if the student is above grade nine? such as a 12th grader with a missing grade nine entry date? And I, I can answer that question. Thank you. If it is blank and entered, there is not a need for a data correction. The next time that we collect data, we will capture the grade nine entry date. It's once that data is collected and it needs to be changed is when a data correction is required. So currently blank, Grade nine entry dates can be entered at any time and they will be collected on the next uh, next accountability data collection and should appear correctly. There is um, just so that people can work together. There is data that we provide to uh, testing coordinators and accountability directors that indicate which students we find to have missing grade nine dates uh, and it could be worked out where you may see that on a report and then the next collection those should go away and that's how you can validate that it has been captured correctly. All right, and we have another question about a SQL report. Um, Mark says we currently have a SQL report null ninth grade entry date in our data audit folder. Why would the report be different than just searching the field equals blank and grade underscore level greater than eight? Uh, it should not be. I would think what we're our goal is there is to look at anyone who is in grades nine through thirteen that do not have a ninth grade entry date. It's just trying to get you that information a little quicker. Yeah, I think the SQL report is just for ease of access, Mark. Yeah. So it should be the same search. It should be. It's we just tried to make it easier for you. Um, also, Mark said it should be made clear that the summer graduates are for those from last summer. Gra graduates after July 15th and before first day this year, 2021, will report as summer grads on next year's GDV, not this year. That's correct. There, there are some questions in the QA that um, I, I can't answer, but I certainly um, would like to ask to see if someone else can. There's a question about uh, the date that should be used for the grade nine entry date. Is that 
seven one of the year, or is that the first day of school? Does it? Is there any guidance on that? I don't. I don't know that we have specifically put guidance out. Um, I can tell you from my perspective, I always use seven one just to make sure that it was consistent. It's yeah. So typically, it's seven one, or or, or forward. Um, just because we usually run EOI on June 30th, so 7 1 would be considered the following year. Uh, can we answer a few more questions here, Rob? Sure. Or do you want to? So no, another, no, no, that's fine. Okay. Um, so another question uh, that came through was when is the first data collection? So when we're talking about accountability data collections, Typically, the first data collection to set the cohort um, is depending on depending on the school is the tenth day of the fall semester or the twentieth day of the school year. So those are our those are those those two collections in um, depending on the school will will begin to set when we have the. Uh, when we have the actual grade nine entry dates collected, what sets what sets and defines the students we're looking at when we look at cohort, the cohort or graduation rates. Um, there's a question, and perhaps it was answered. Who runs the GDB report? That's a great question. I'm going to answer that. That the LEA CIS coordinator would be the one to refer that question to in in my district the uh, I think the best one to answer that question with is the CIS coordinator because they would determine who has the rights to run the state reports in their districts. And then I think the last one that I was seeing is can you review the steps about exactly how we run the GDB report within power school. Uh, I actually can. That is what's next in line. That was a great segue into the next few slides. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, thanks. When you are running the report on the state reporting dashboard, if you click on state reports on the left menu in PowerSchool, you will see both these reports. You will see their dates, their submission window are there. And then you will see a little run button that has been highlighted next to those reports. Inside that submission window, if you hit run, that will start the little circle of dots running to let you know that it is running. And sometimes, depending on the time of year, depending on how many people are there, it will run in five seconds. It may take a couple minutes. If you hit the refresh button at the top of the screen, then it will automatically refresh until your report populates. So that should answer the question of how to run it. I am now going to spend a little bit of time going over some of the reports. Again, I only have an hour with you today. If we determine this is really kind of a broad overview, if we determine from feedback from this webinar, uh, if you would like to see more in depth about this report, other than this broad overview, we are happy to do that, but this is just a broad overview. So we're gonna show you some screenshots over the next several slides that will um, go over what you will see once the report is run. So once the report is run, it will give you these choices to review. You will have the GDV views, which I will go into detail about one of them, uh, it will give you GDV exceptions. Those will be your warnings and your fatals, and then it will give you common exceptions. A quick note about the GDV views, those are very much what they are. You click on that, it will then pull up a screen that has exactly what it says. Here's all your graduates. Here's your diploma graduate data verification for by postgraduate intent. So it's looking at those fields that we talked about earlier. Your, and then uh, here's a list of graduates by course of study or certificates by course of study. Then you have the exceptions. And one of the things that I like best about the exceptions on this is what this will do is once you click on those exceptions, it will tell you like, for example, that fatal, which we all know we can't have fatals. 
If it says students missing next grade of 99 and or next school indicator of graduate school, if you click on that, it will pull up a list of students and it will actually tell you here are the students you need to fix this for and it will tell you how to fix that. So these reports are very beneficial. Uh, and I recommend, again, you're running this frequently, so you always want to come back to this screen to make sure you don't have any, any fatals, especially any fatals, and you want to verify your warnings and see if those can be adjusted as well. TV reports at the LEA level, you have the preliminary and the final, and you can see all those lists there that you can look at and run them at the LEA level. This screen, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking on. This is the report that I felt was the most important to cover with you. This is a fall GDV view, as you can see at the top, choose category, the data view. This is the graduate data review for all classifications. This report, to me, is the most important report in GDV. Obviously, that's personal opinion. Others may feel that there's a different one, but I felt this was the most important because these are the lists that should match when I work with accountability, especially if I'm looking at the cohort, it should, everyone on this list should be in my cohort list through accountability services. So what you can see here is you have all your basic student information, you have um, their names, their sex, their ethnicity, and then you see the course of study, which it is pulling off that ninth grade entry date. You see the graduation document, in this case, it says diploma, and then you can see the classification. This is when they uh, graduated. You have a mid-year graduate on the screen. You have a regular program graduate. Uh, if it was a summer school graduate, then that summer school graduate would show up here as well. And then you see the bound four. So all those fields we talked about earlier are on this, on here, and populate in order for you to be able to verify all of your graduates that you uh, have to ensure accuracy. I do want to, do we have any questions on that, Tessa? Before we get into troubleshooting, are there any more questions? Um, I don't see any that we haven't already answered. Okay, and then I will continue with troubleshooting. Uh, One someone, of the, sorry, someone is asking, no. can you review the steps about exactly how we run the GDV report with, within PowerSchool? Um, I did not intend to do that here, but we are happy to set up another webinar just for CIS coordinators if they would like to go over that. Because what they're, I believe what they're wanting to see is a training where they pull it up and we run through it and show and all of that. Um, I was not prepared to do that here today, but we can do that if that is a request. Okay, and someone else asked another question and, and I did answer it, but I'll go ahead and um, verbalize it. If I understand correctly, the final GDV report is only run at graduation time, EOI, mid-year, and summer. Is there any harm in running the preliminary report any time? Um, and my response was, I said, no, you can run continuously until the submission end date. It is a good idea to run often and fix errors as needed. And that is absolutely correct. And then you can, up until the submission end date, don't forget that if somebody comes up to you, which can happen, if somebody, you've approved the report, it's June 28th, you've approved the report, and somebody comes up to you on June 29th and says, we got one more across, you can unapprove that report because you're still in the submission window, rerun it, add that student, rerun it, and then make sure that student is on the PowerSchool GDV report and then check with accountability services the next day to see if that student showed up. So as long as you're still within that submission window, you can unapprove it, rerun it, make it right, rerun it again, approve it, and then um, approve the report after you've made those corrections. So when troubleshooting this report, students not showing up, which is the biggest uh, concern one has on this report usually. 
you want to check the North Carolina academic screen and make sure all those fields are filled out and they are filled out correctly. And you also want to check the transfer info screen for accuracy to make sure there's only one record on there that shows the student is has graduated if they have run run through their process uh, to make sure that it all looks like it should. We added a troubleshooting for summer grads because they're a little bit trickier. You want to make sure that you have the QRD directions in hand whenever you do a summer graduate to make sure that the LOCS local summer school grade was stored properly. The diploma met and issue dates are specific based on those directions. And the transfer info screen has only one W6 record and the exit date must be on or before the diploma granted an issue date. So that is from a troubleshooting standpoint, those are the key things that we want to make sure you understand. I have used that QRD lot. I, I am know it works. Um, and those are the items that we just have to make sure are correct for troubleshooting. Nine times out of 10, if you look at the items that are on this screen, it should fix most of your troubleshooting errors on a GDV report. And if you troubleshoot, and you do all these things that we're looking at, and you've reached out to the PowerSchool help desk to help you if a student is not showing. Um, at, at that, I would say, if you've done the troubleshooting that we've shown you, then you would do a PowerSchool help desk ticket through the SIS coordinator who has those rights to do that. And then PowerSchool would work to fix the problem. And we understand the GDV is a extremely timed report. So we look at with these tickets daily with PowerSchool, and if we see these tickets pop up, we jump on them pretty quickly because we understand the importance of making sure that this data is accurate or these data is accurate. I do want to talk about overrides quickly. An override is will need to be used by the school administrator when a student has met the graduation requirement and is not reflected on the power school transcript. On the North Carolina academic screen, you have several overrides that you can do. You have endorsement overrides, diploma overrides, and UNC overrides. You very simply go to the North Carolina academic screen, you say yes to the override, and then you have to make a note as to why you did the override. One thing I do want to point out is override should be done as a last resort. I do ask, I know everybody's doing transcript reviews around the same time that this report is being run. They're making sure all the kids met the state and local requirements. Is that you do check the course codes first to make sure that the course codes are accurate, that they are truly reflection, because if there's a course code error, it could cause the, the endorsements to not run correctly. Do a power school ticket if you find it is not reporting correctly. Uh, if you do have to use this, please enter a detailed reason in the override notes so that we understand why an override was used. This again, I will tell you, once you do a power school ticket on endorsements, we jump on that very quickly because we understand the sense of urgency of getting that fixed. So we usually have a team of people that are working on that to get that solution for you very quickly, because I would prefer to get the problem fixed and an override not be used. So again, please only use those as a last resort once you have trouble done troubleshooting steps to determine why the override is not, or why the um, transcript is not calculating correctly for any endorsements or the UNC minimum requirements. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, collaborating with accountability that occurs with the GDV report. Accountability services creates a graduate file for each public school unit that is updated daily from PowerSchool. PowerSchool and accountability staff definitely need to work together to compare the students found in, the, in their file with what's expected to be found. The differences should be identified and fixed in PowerSchool. And if it is expected that a student is a graduate and the student is not in the graduate file from accountability, they are not coded correctly in PowerSchool. We have added to this for those of you who are unfamiliar or if you are new to the um, test coordinator role, the PATH. 
path to accountability service graduate file uh, on the shell is 2021 folder to the CGR folder and then to the grad file. Curtis, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think I think you covered that well with the uh, location of the graduate file, and I, and you know it it is important to note that that is the data we get directly from Power Schools. So if those aren't aren't matching, that's that's a great that's a great collaboration to help make sure that everything is is coded correctly in the Power School uh, system to make sure that those are flowing accurately uh, when you expect them. I think that. That gets back to um, that gets back to that earlier first original question really about when do graduates populate into um, the CGR audit, which is the accountability files. Um, I can I can say with confidence that we're running those files. So if you're not so if accountability directors that are listening, if you're not seeing mid year and summer graduates, then it's possible that the report hasn't been run yet by schools or that something's not quite right, and that would be great collaboration to start to figure out how, why that's happening. And before we get bombarded with a whole bunch of questions, because I said on the shell, um, I'm sure one of the questions that will be asked is who has access to the shell. Those who have access to the shell are very few and far between. It is the um, LEA test coordinator, the PSU test coordinator that would have access to the shell and that permission has to be requested and it has to be approved by the RAC. I hope I said that correctly, Curtis. Yes, so the accountability directors and testing coordinators would have that file and could work with power school to uh, to figure out a way to collaborate together in reviewing that data. At a correction window, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about this portion. There is a data correction window after the report is due. So the report's due June 30. And this is really after the final graduation data verification, which is due July 20th. So you're doing your data correction and I believe the data correction window usually is, um, I believe from September 1 to October 1. You're actually, actually that so data corrections can be submitted throughout the summer if they're identified. The final official data correction window is the day after the state board meeting with in September, which is. I think the third this year until the following Friday, which I think is the I'm trying to do my mental math. So please forgive me like the 12th or 13th, um, whatever that Friday is, that is the official, that would be the end of it. No data corrections can be submitted after that time. Thank you, Curtis. Yep. The data correction is due. Here are the steps for this report specifically. Please remember you've heard Tessa, Curtis and myself kind of jumping in here, um, please remember that this is still a collaboration and we really need for this process to be followed. If there is a data correction, the PSU needs to inform the regional accountability correct coordinator, turn in the data correction form, then wait for approval of data correction from DPI accountability services. Once you have that, log a ticket with PowerSchool to unlock and correct the data, rerun and approve the report. And then once the data correction is win window is completed, no changes can be made. And I want to reiterate that, that no changes can be made once that data correction window is over, as Curtis has already said as well. Before we end and start to take some questions, um, I do want to go over best practices. The first best practice with all of this is to review all transcripts to ensure they meet all local and state requirements prior to finalizing the GDV. Remove or add any students who are incorrect. We often talk about adding students. However, we have not really talked about removing students. So we just need to make sure that students who don't meet those requirements who might have been placed on that list um, before that knowledge, anyone was aware of that knowledge, those students should be removed. Run the preliminary GDV and the final GDV often in the submission windows 
review the PowerSchool GDV report and compare it to the accountability services grad file for accuracy, approve it before the submission window ends, complete current year data corrections in a timely manner. Please, as Curtis has mentioned earlier, data corrections can come to him frequently and they will get fixed and adjusted. So please make sure that you are doing those data corrections in a timely manner. And, and one other thing, Rob, those, those data corrections would come through uh, the testing coordinator and accountability directors. Um, so if you have, if you think there's something that needs to be fixed you can work with them to get those data corrections submitted that is all that we had for the basic overview of the gdv report um, we tried to provide this today for audiences that are both power school as well as accountability services to give just a good overview of what this report is how this report works and the importance of the fields in power school and how they correlate to accountability services. So we're going to take some of the remaining time we have to see if there are any questions out there that we need to answer. And Tessa or John, do we have any questions? Um, I do see one about if there's an update regarding the global language endorsement. There's an update about the global language endorsement. I need a little more specifics on the question. Is that because they believe it's not working correctly? I'm guessing so. We'll see if they'll shoot in some additional. Yes, um, I guess apparently is not is not or was not working correctly at some point. If I would ask that if this person has filed a ticket with Power School, please turn in a ticket to Power School so we can get it looked at. I know they are looking at some endorsements now, and I don't have any updates on that specifically. But if I have a specific ticket number, I will be glad to look at that with Power School to see if we can't get that fixed. And please be specific in the student that it's not working with and why it's not working. Because sometimes, again, it comes down to um, incorrect course code. So it might be working as a whole, but there might be an incorrect course code causing it not to work with specific students. Any more questions? We do have one on the XG negative nine. Do the students that are XG negative nine this year that are not graduating this year, will they remain XG negative nine or will their grade level change to another negative number? And then John did answer this question. Um, he said those students would remain in XG negative nine next year. Yeah, and that's correct. Are there any more questions? Uh, Wendy, I would recommend you submit a power school ticket for your question. Um, you had a question about the early college that please submit a ticket to power school. Um, and then you can send the ticket number to. Rob, John, or myself for assistance if you need further assistance with that. Um, someone is asking, how do you run an endorsement report for all seniors? That is a very good question. I don't know that we have an endorsement report. John or Tessa, have you seen one? We have. Um, I think I if think the, the diploma the, assessment report would give that. Correct. I was going to say the best we have is the diploma assessment Perfect. report. Um, I would recommend that you select all 12th graders and then run the diploma assessment report based on them. It should run based off of your current selection. Um, do summer grads count towards our four year cohort or do they count as a fifth year grad? I'll take that one. Um, students who are entered 
in to the GDV2, the final GDV, the prior to that graduate prior to July 15th are included in the are included in the graduates for the current year. So if that is, say for example, that is the end of the student's fourth year, the student is is a it was ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth for four years, and they didn't graduate uh, at the beginning of June with the rest of the students, took a summer course and then graduated, and they were included by July 15th, they would be in the four year cohort. If the student is put into into the GDB as a summer graduate on July 16th or later, then they would be in the fifth year graduate as a fifth year graduate. So making sure that those students are included in if students graduate by July 15th, making sure they're included in that final GDB is is very important. Thank you, Curtis. Um, we have another question in order for early grads to go through EOI, do they need to be made active in power school? Um, and I can take that 1. No, you do not need to make them active. Um, we have a script that runs. Before the EOI button is pressed, so a script is run on the, the early graduates and the graduates that will make them active and allow them to run properly through EOI. So I would just say follow follow the QDR steps. QRD steps, sorry. <laughs> well, country radio there. Um, so I would say follow those steps exactly as they are in the QRD. John, do we have any questions in Q and A? Um, yes. Yeah, so I see one. So what about XG students that are graduating this year? Do they need to be moved to grade 12 first so they can be graduated or can they be graduated with a certificate straight out of negative nine? I believe I know the answer to that question, but I would like to verify that before I answer that and make sure that the logic is reporting correctly, but they should, but I will verify that in the FAQ we put out. And um, is it correct that once the diploma granted date is populated, data is sent to CFNC, and if so, that data is only sent once? I am trying to remember the field um, that does that. It is only sent once, and I know that we will be pulling that on uh, June 24th this year. I think it's the diploma issue date, Rob. I was going to say, I think it's the diploma issue date. I think you're right, Tess. But we will verify that as well in the FAQ. And the last one I see here in the Q&A right now we have a student in an early college. He, okay, he returned in 2021 into 13th grade, but he only attended for one day and he decided to just graduate with his 12th grade credits and call it a day. What entries do we need to make for that? Should they be considered a mid-year graduate? I am thinking, I think that I would have to know more specifics. So if whoever asked that question could shoot me an email, I'd be happy to answer that question with them. Perfect. Um, and let's see, we've got one about when will the CTE, ugh, when will the CTE info be available on the grad requirements screen? Um, and I know yeah. we're working on that, right? But I don't know. If we That's the. That's the best answer, John. We are working on that, and as soon as we finish with that, we will put try to get it on the on the graduate graduation requirement screen as quick as we can. But currently, we are working due to a lot of the changes that occur with Perkins Five. It's just taking a little bit of time. And I just want to reiterate and thank you, Mark. Um, summer grads reporting now on the preliminary GDV 
and we'll also report on the final GDV, are last summer grads. If grads after 7 15 21, they don't report until next year's reports. Are there any other questions? Um, I've got one about are there common reasons a student would be listed on the GDV report in PowerSchool but not in the grad file in the secure shell? Curtis, do you have an answer to that? Um, I could throw out some thoughts and you can uh, confirm or deny them. Something, something about that record does not flag them as a graduate. So they're not being passed out of power school as a graduate. So, so I, I'm not, and I'm not sure what that would be, but typically if you're not able to find them in the grad files that accountability services has, it means that for some reason that data was not exported out of power school. Uh, in, into data for us to look at. So what what's causing it to stop the export? I'd have to defer to you, but that would that's where that ends up being typically. And and I would agree with that. And I think that I would have to look again. That's a special kind of power school ticket as well for that because we we'd, we'd want to look at the dates to try to determine if there is a date range problem which is causing that. Because I don't know that I've ever seen a student show up on that report and not show up on the um, report that's through accountability services. We have a question about the UNC requirements running. When or will the UNC requirements run overnight or will the counselors have to click all students? Um, it will once it hits a certain time of year and we can kind of get those dates, it will run overnight. But I would, um, if something doesn't look right, of course you want to run it manually, but the, I believe it will run overnight uh, once we get closer to the graduation time. And it should run whenever the stored grades process is, is ran as well. Um, it should automatically calculate the UNC requirements. Are there any other questions? Mark has a comment about the PG, PGDV. Okay. Um, he says, if they haven't run the PGDV recently, accountability won't have it. Maybe they were at one time and something changed. Um, 11, and he says 11th graders can be graduated without promoting to 12th. That's correct. Thank you, Mark. Um, Cheryl, I think she's referring to the UNC requirement, says it didn't after first semester this year. Okay. Um, if you would, please do a ticket and we will get that looked at. And again, we'll take all these questions and we will try to develop an FAQ within the next week or two. And uh, Again, I wanted to just reiterate the purpose of this webinar. It was to give kind of a broad overview of how the GDV report works and, and how it communicates to accountability services. If we determine from looking at the questions or the feedback that is provided that we need to have a more in-depth webinar for PowerSchool uh, CIS coordinators on how to run the report, looking at the reports, clearing up the exceptions, we can set that up as well. Uh, we'll We'll let you guide us on that. And if you feel that's necessary, just let us know. Thank you. And for those folks that are accountability and testing coordinators who joined us today, if you have questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to your regional accountability coordinator. They can collect those questions and we can try to get some specific answers. If you have some questions about not seeing students in the data or and 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 if the data is running. Uh, we can certainly check to make sure that that's happening. Thank you. And if 
if there are there any other questions, I don't want to leave them short. Um, we do have some questions about getting added to the listserv. Um, so I will say if you would like to be added to the listserv, please send an email to home underscore base at dpi.nc.gov with the request to be added. And I will drop that in the chat as well. We hope that this was beneficial with you. Anytime I end a webinar, I will always say, I hope that this has been beneficial for you. We hope you were able to learn something today. Uh, and we look forward to the next one that we do with you. Any more questions, Tessa? I see some questions about, um, somebody says, so to be clear, was it said that data isn't sent to CFNC until later in June, even for early grads? It, I will confirm that, but yes, it was said that, and I will confirm that in the FAQ since it was a question. I can't speak to early grads, so I will find out about early grads. And we're getting some questions about how soon will this recording be posted? Um, uh, we will try and get it out tomorrow, but there's no guarantee. It really just depends on how quickly we can download and clean up the recording and get it out with the, the slide deck. Um, if it doesn't go out in tomorrow's bulletin, it'll go out in next the Friday, next Friday's bulletin. And we'll make sure to get it posted on to uh, TNN as soon as it goes out from the home base team. Well, the hour is two o'clock. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you thank everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you everyone.